We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the darkened hour. Okay, hello everyone and hello Adam. Ah, uh, good, good afternoon Richard. So, Adam, if I was to describe the subject of today's interview as being, we're going to talk about an intelligence agency that had information on the hijackers in the country but didn't pass it on to the FBI. The audience might think, okay, yeah, I know this one. We're going to be talking about Alex Station, right? Or if I was to talk about an intelligence agency which had a computer system which figured out where the hijackers were and what they were doing and so on, but then didn't utilize that information, people might think, oh, that's the NSA and ThinFred, William Binney's program. And, and it is. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Able Danger at the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, right? Um, and the man most associated with that, Colonel Anthony Schaefer. So why don't you um, start off, Adam, by just picking up that story wherever. I might have to ask you to um, define, that. Well, mention a bit about what the DIA is at some point, because unlike the CIA, it's, um, it's not so well known at all, right? So if you can throw that in, but give us a narrative of this whole story. You've just written, uh, I think, one of your longest articles on it, very good article, we'll link to that. So, so pick up that narrative wherever you wish to. Right, well, I'll, I'll just explain what the Defense Intelligence Agency is. Uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency um, is, a, is an intelligence agency inside uh, the United States uh, federal government. It's a component of the Department of Defense and the United States intelligence community as a whole, the NSA, the, the CIA, and in which the DIA intelligence operations extend beyond the zones of like combat and, and approximately like half of its employees serve overseas. And there are hundreds of locations uh, inside the United States uh, in embassies and, and in, in embassies of over 140 countries, they're much more expansive and much more covert than, say, the CIA, which is uh, an, an, an arm unto itself, where the Defense Intelligence Agency is an, is an arm of the State Department itself. Okay, you know what? I think on another occasion, we might do a full show on the Defense Intelligence Agency because, I mean, one of the things. Uh, that fascinated me about it is it, it's, its budget is actually bigger than the CIA's. I'm correct about that, aren't I? Yeah, but by the billions, it's, it's yeah. much more, much more fun. Uh, so, but the, like this, there's volumes, libraries of books written on the history of the CIA, which I'm sure there's you know a lot more we don't know, of course. But then you've got this other organization, even bigger, and who knows anything about it really? You know, so that that fascinates me. I'd love to delve into it deeper, but we'll keep it on. You know, sort of saying the minimum we need today because we want to talk about this specific program, Able Danger. One question I have about the DIA, though, um, and people will see why this is relevant in a minute. Do they have the same restrictions as the CIA um, in operating inside the United States? The CIA are forbidden from doing that, and the US military don't because of possum comitatus, right? That, that they're restricted. Does that, does that restriction apply to the DIA? Yes, it does. Actually, this is actually brought up in the uh, 2006 Senate Select Committee uh, regarding uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer, whereas the Department of Defense has to abide by Posse Comitatus Act um, and only use information in regards to non-US persons. Now that, that's, a, that's not something I'm gonna bring up in regards to the April Danger Program because it's gonna be very important as to why 
the information collected by Able Danger was not shared with federal agencies like the FBI. Okay, okay. So go on then and tell us a bit about Able Danger and all that. Sure. Right. Well, we'll start with uh, the the two uh, co-opted uh, generals that created helped create Able Danger, and that's General Peter Shoemaker, who is the chief of army, uh, chief of staff for the army, and General uh, Hugh Shelton, who is the chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, so by the spring of 1999, they would co-opt a covert military operation, which is codenamed Able Danger. The plan was to operate independently from government agencies like the NSA, the FBI, and the CIA, and develop their own sensitive information uh, in the transnational terrorism field, which involved uh, other military agencies like the Joint Special Operations Command, or in short, JSOC, uh, and the Defense Intelligence Agency. This would also include agencies within the U.S. Army, um, which are the U.S. Special Operations Command, or SOCOM for short, and the Land Information Warfare Center, LIWA for short. Um, they both support the Intelligence and Security Command of the United States. The Able Danger team uh, was very small. So this is a very secretive, covert group that even many high-ranking officials in the Pentagon weren't even aware about. The only people who were aware of this was uh, Shoemaker and Shelton at the time. Now, the Able Danger team was selected uh, due to their specific fields of intelligence gathering. And these were the following people. Uh, U.S. Navy Captain Scott Philpott, uh, he was selected as the Able Danger team leader. Uh, U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer, of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, Eric Kleinsmith, Army Major, and the Chief of Intelligence of the Land Information Warfare Activity. James D. Smith, who is a defense contractor from Orion Scientific Systems. And Dr. Eileen Presser. Uh, she's from the Land Information War Activity and she's the analytical lead. Now, according to Anthony Schaefer, the concept of Able Danger was actually General Shoemaker's idea. By summer of 1999, Schaefer would then begin promoting the Able Danger operation to CIA representatives uh, from uh, Alex Station in a classified meeting in SOCOM headquarters located at Fort Bragg, North Carolina in the U.S. Army Special Operations Command. After his presentation, the CIA representatives uh, from Alex Station, which is a virtual station, also collecting data, metadata about bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, according to Schaefer, in a Senate Select Committee hearing done in 2005, he claims the CIA reps uh, would not fully endorse Able Danger and said that they would interfere with uh, CIA's Alex Station and he told Schaefer that they would not share any information with anyone within the U.S. Army. So you, you can see already that even before Able Danger was starting, that the CIA was automatically dismissing any type of competing agency in which was going, obviously, because Schaefer was quite uh, shocked afterwards. He was thinking in his head naively um, that, he thought that everybody in the United States was working together to fight right. against terrorism. Well, more than that, they were quite overt about it, weren't they? And the reasons the CIA just said, well, yeah, we don't want you getting the credit if you found something out that we didn't. Schaefer said they were just, they were that overt. In <laughs> They didn't try and even hide the reasons under some sort of, you know, security breach or something. Right, I, I think that has a lot to do with the arrogance of the CIA, thinking they could get away with... Uh, um, not sharing information with other competing federal or even Pentagon agencies. Well, yeah, in a sense, they do get away with it. <laughs> sure, right, yeah, exactly. But um, that just goes to show you that there's different agendas here regarding uh, the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies like the CIA. Um, but Able Danger was to collect any information uh, using hum human, which is human intelligence, and SIGINT, which is signals intelligence 
regarding terror cells abroad and inside the United States. Um, Schaefer would then meet with General Shoemaker in September of 99, in which Shoemaker um, allowed Schaefer's Afghan unit, which is codenamed Stratus Ivy, which was a special mission unit that conducted direct support to the Department of Defense and was focused on offensive information operations. Um, they would use human, more so human intelligence by going into um, madrasas or shopkeepers in Afghanistan and collect information about uh, certain individuals they were monitoring. Now, with Shoemaker's idea, Schaefer then went to the leader of the Able Danger team, Scott Philpott, and pitched the idea of using his Land of Information Warfare Center uh, with the Stratus IV unit, and they both immediately agreed. They thought this was a great idea. So Schaefer immediately then tells the U.S. Special Operations Command, SOCOM officials, to start looking into uh, the U.S. Army's land information warfare act activity and its information dominance center for potential use in assisting in the Able Danger program. So they're using these, um, these uh, electronic uh, devices inside the U U.S. Army to coincide with the human intelligence from the Able Danger and Stratus IV units. So they would get massive amounts of data in, in short time, I'll tell you in a bit. But by, by the winter of that same year of 99, Able Danger was able to identify two of the three terror cells inside the United States. One cell was called the Brooklyn cell. That was led by Omar Abdel Rahman of the Al Farouk Mosque, who would later be involved with, who was, who was involved with the, um, the Landmarks plot. And, in and what, what sense was, was it led by him? This is actually something I didn't, couldn't quite get my head around in um, Schaefer's book. In what sense was it led by him? Because he was in jail at that point. Well, I mean, even though he was in jail, he's still the leader of the Brooklyn cell because right. once Rockman went into prison, you still had notable members still around inside the Alfred Mosque. In fact, Ironically, now that you bring it up, Alfred Mark is still operating inside Brooklyn today. Okay, today. so actually, actually this, I did want to bring this up. I, I don't want to take you on a tangent now when you're explaining right. Able Danger, but it, it's one of those things that when I thought about it, I'm surprised it never occurred to me because we talked all about the 93 bombing and the landmarks plot and then the arrest of the conspirators. They all went to jail and um, Rachman eventually died there, didn't he, a couple of years ago. Um, but I never thought to ask, what became of the Brooklyn Mosque and the um, the refugee center there, right? It, is it? I just kind of assumed it all sort of fizzled out in my mind. I mean, but you'll say no, it didn't. It carries on through nine eleven and through this day. You still have this um, uh, this the, the radicalized mosque going on there, and um, more than that, Mohammed Atta was associated with it. So yeah, I, I, I might be interrupting your narrative there, Adam. For, so no, not at all. In fact, no, no, because a lot of the original members of 1993 are all in jail at this point. Mapu, Nabalima, Salami, for their participation in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. But you also had uh, other members who weren't involved in that bombing, but were involved with the landmarks plot. Omar Abdel Rahman, Sadiq, Sadiq Ali, and a number of others. It was like 12 others. But those are the more notable members. And that's what uh, a lot of people tend to uh, confuse. Uh, especially in regards to Imad Salem's participation. Um, a lot of people, for example, just to give a short thing, uh, short uh, leeway here, Imad Salem is actually uh, confused with building the bomb uh, of World Trade Center bombing. That's not true. Yeah. Um, he, he helped build the bomb for the landmarks plot in which the FBI was monitoring a warehouse in Jamaica. Yeah, Queen. see, Emad Salem did a recording. He was the FBI's mole in the cell and the whole story there. Right. And he did, he did do a recording where it did sound like he was saying, I built the bomb. Your, your informant, your confidential informant built the bomb that went off the Trade Center. That's right. Um, but it, he's not, and he's, he's cleared that up, and it's not consistent right. with what have you. With, with, with Shaper here, he's actually just going by the information that he, he, he gathered using human intelligence regarding about the the uh the Farouk mosque of 1993 world trade center bombing and the landmark plot now Rachman was still considered even to to his to his death the leader of the brooklyn soul of the al Farouk mosque right wow right and right now to this very day al Farouk mosque al masjid is called 
um, is still operating in Brooklyn to this very day. So it's open still. And, and what Schaefer is saying is that Mohammed Atta was involved in that mount in that mosque in some way. He he went. There. No, it did because it did because his the other the other cell that he's referring to is the Brooklyn uh, the Hamburg cell. That's uh, the Hamburg cell. So so you have the because uh, there's a lot of confusion. You have the Brooklyn cell, uh, which is sometimes confused with Mohammed Atta, but it's not. There's two cells: Brooklyn cell, that's Al Abdul okay. Rahman, the Hamburg cell, which is Mohammed Atta. Now. Mohammed Atta was uh, in New York for a little bit. Right, but not also, the Brooklyn cell. Right, he's not involved with the Brooklyn cell. Okay, anymore. okay. So there's no there's no 9-11 Brooklyn cell connection? No, no, no. Okay, that, okay. Right. Separate, separate entities. But um, Orion, or Orion Systems would start using and constructing large-scale charts to connect faces uh, pinned to this chart in connection with um, other terrorist individuals, such as the chart started with bin Laden, of course, being in the middle, and then his connections to uh, a face of Ayman al-Swahiri, for example. And then they, they would draw a line to Omar Abdel Rahman, Ali Muhammad, Wadi al Hajj, Muhammad Atta, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you're seeing this branch out effect on this chart. And the chart in 10 months' time had like, a hundred faces on maybe and, and what Abe Danger is doing it's going into things like Al Qaeda chat rooms and looking at financial transaction details and who's meeting who where and just creating a and like um I think I'm William, 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 it was either William Binney or Thomas Drake said about the NSA that the the interesting information is who's talking to who. If you see the connections you can get the whole web and put it together. So it's a, it it sounded to me like a similar thing to the NSA's thin fed program. I mean, there's probably yes. huge differences, but, you know, it sounds like similar in result to what it was kicking up. Right. Whereas the NSA is getting direct information from electronic surveillance. Right. The, the Able Danger team was using human intelligence through signals intelligence to gather information from oh, okay. third okay. So, I, so you, I, you said that they um, broke three cells or how, how you put it, the Brooklyn, that they had some monitoring of Brooklyn and the Hamburg cell, and what was the other one? No, that, I never understand who was the third uh, cell. Um, they, this could be a renegade group of people that may have involved with uh, maybe the Hamburg or the Brooklyn cell support, but they weren't a major uh, organization or a major conduit, such as Muhammad Atta. Right, so there's no reason to think they got the West Coast cell of Khalid Al-Midhar. Right. Well, that, that's a very good point, actually, because remember now, the, the West Coast cell could be, is, is even though they're affiliated with the 9 level attacks, they were separate from the Hamburg cell because uh, they were monitored by Saudi intelligence, hmm. whereas U.S. intelligence and Israeli intelligence were monitoring the Hamburg and the Brooklyn cell, the Al-Farouk Mosque. So who... It, it, it's not particularly clear who that third cell was, but um, it, it would have to be either the the cell out west or the connections with the Maktab al Kidamat, which is the Afghan services office in Arizona, because right, that's, yes. the first, that's the first office inside the United States ever built. Well, I'm just noticing in his book, um, Anthony Schaefer talks about that they picked up on a lot of activity in Yemen. Um, in the year 2000, realized there was a lot going on in Yemen prior to the coal bombing. So there was a connection, like a strong connection between the Yemen hub and the West Coast cell, right, in terms of, um, right. was it Khalid Al-Madidhar's wife uh, there, or was it Nafar Hamzi, I forget which one, but one of them had a wife actually living at the Yemen hub, right, and they were phoning from inside the United States. So that caused me to wonder. Yeah, that's Khalid Al-Madidhar. Uh, mm. That the home is owned by Ahmed al Khadr. Uh, and that's the conduit to which all Al Qaeda operatives were going through. And um, it, yeah, it, even though they're, they're, these cells inside the United States may operate independently in terms of goals which they wanted to achieve, they also uh, are sim like similarly involved with one another. They uh, flow between one another because their agenda is the same. It's the attack of inside the United States whether they know each other. For example, Ramzi Youssef and Osama bin Laden didn't know each other. They heard of each other, but they didn't know each other, even though they both conducted uh, operations separately. Ramzi Youssef with the 93 bombing of the World Trade Center, bin Laden somehow involved 
with the 9-11 bombing of the World Trade Center in 2001. Hmm. Now, the Able Danger program was using data mining techniques to collect this information. And by 2000, the Able Danger unit would begin informing General Shoemaker about the information collected thus far. However, this is really important. U.S. Special Operations Command lawyers would object to the use of the intelligence regarding Muhammad Atta, Ziajar, and Marwan al shahi They were suggesting that all three would qualify as U.S. persons because all three had U.S. student visas. Um, in time, over the years, Schaefer would begin losing support of the Defense Intelligence Agency because of this point regarding the so-called lawyers, restricting the use of any intelligible information regarding um, the Hamburg cell. So they didn't want to be seen as a spying on American citizens, even though the irony is, is that they really technically weren't U.S. citizens, even though they had uh, temporary student visas at the time. Now, um, according to Major Eric Kleinsmith, he's actually ordered to destroy three terabytes of information collected from the Able Danger, uh, which is 16 months to this point. Um, the order came from somebody within the SOCOM office where he told him in a, in a jokingly but warning manner that um, holding the information regarding past 30 days is against the law. Now this, however, would be determined not to be factually true in regards to the Hamburg cell in a 2000 Senate Select Committee hearing where it's later determined that Otto was not considered um, was not considered a U.S. citizen, and that's coming from the testimony of William Dugan, who is representing the Department of Defense. So all that information is destroyed from Able Danger now. All the information, but Schieffer actually thinks that not everything was destroyed, and the fact that the Department of Defense is still holding on to most, if not all, of the information. And able danger collect. Okay, so to what to what extent do you think that holds up, right? Because I mean, it was only a couple of episodes ago we were talking about was it credible that the FBI were just so concerned about not opening Zacharias Masawi's laptop because they didn't want to violate the rights of this French Algerian guy? Okay, so is that is the FBI an organization that's hamstrung by bureaucracy, or is this an excuse? Okay, is this like a behavior facilitating attacks? And here we run into the same question again, right? Of like, well, and because with Zachary's wife, so we, we can look back now and say, well, clearly there was justification. Like, th there was clearly sufficient level of justification at the time, that was obvious at the time, to, um, to search his laptop. And looking at this now, um, Able, yeah, Able Danger had to delete uh, this information and they were unable, not only to utilize it themselves, but to pass it on to the FBI, right? So. Do you think these legal justifications, does it hold any water that these legal justifications have any validity to them? Or does, does it, again, put the question on the table that there are, there are two ways of looking at this? And one is this was um, yet another example of like behavior that allowed the attacks to go ahead. Well, I mean, one would have to be very careful in, in, in implicating that certain agencies within the U.S. government wanted these attacks to happen. Now, I, I if you were to put a gun to my head, I would say, yes. Do I have absolute verifiable information to suggest so? I could make a good argument for it. Sure. I really could, especially for the CIA. Yeah. Now, yeah, sure. when, it comes, when it comes to the FBI, that's a little bit tougher, and I don't think so. I, but although their actions suggest that they, they wanted something like this to happen, especially in the case of Zacharias Nassau, mm -hmm. where Colleen Rowley, who involved with the Minneapolis FBI office, even states that she was rebuffed by her superior, which is Robert Bowman, who was the, di the director of uh, Minnesota uh, field office. Sure. It's just when you see the same, like essentially we've established CIA, right. FBI, DIA, and NSA had sufficient information probably to stop the attacks, right? But then bureaucracy got in the way in all of them or something got in the way it, it's you, you can't then say that's random right there's got to be some consistent factor behind all of these and that could be an excessive bureaucracy or it could be intentional but we, we're running into it again here the other thing i read in um uh, anton book or it could have been your article or both 
was um, references to Waco, right? That they weren't gonna, either weren't going to pass the information on to the FBI or weren't going to do it because they didn't want another Waco incident. That was called upon as a justification for not passing it on, which I found really bizarre. Can you shine any light on that? I probably couldn't. Uh, no, it's uh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, one thing about Waco was that uh, I, I, I was around when it happened. I'm not normally asking you to shine light on Waco, but um, just on on the use of that as a justification um, for not oh. utilizing this information in able danger. Right, actually, that, that was a... All right, I understood. I, I was actually confused. I thought you maybe wanted to go on a tangent with Waco. But no, yeah, that... No. Uh, in fact, Schaefer <laughs> actually... Right. right, no, yeah, right. But Schaefer actually would conduct meetings with the FBI. And each time he would try to uh, hold closed-door meetings, he actually was... Inter interfered with by SOCOM lawyers. And the reason was simple. The SOCOM lawyers said that they this, that the unit, the Able Danger Unit, was not allowed to share information that they collected with this, with this covert operation with the FBI because of, quote unquote, fear for potential blowback. Um, and the blowback was regarding to like Waco, whereas, you know, that was intentional. They could have arrested, um, uh, I'm sorry, what, what, what's that, David uh, Koke, uh, Koresh? Koresh, yeah. David Koresh. yeah, yeah. Like they saw him jogging in the morning, right? They could have arrested him. Yeah, the him whole there, thing stinks. Without, right, 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 yeah. Um, but what, they, what, what, Able Day, what the SOCOM lawyers were saying is that they didn't want to share information with outside agencies, especially uh, an internal agency in the United States like the FBI. And then they use that information from Able Danger, and then they go and arrest it, or, or try to arrest Otto and stuff. Which just seems like a bizarre justification. We can't tell the FBI anything in case they blockade a mosque, shoot bullets into it, set it on fire, and kill all the Muslims. You know, it's like just the FBI are like that. You know, I don't, it's just that just seems like the most far out justification. For I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't understand the like the almost as pertinent need not to share any information, like any type of information. I can, although on the judicial level, yes, you're not allowed to use. Um, human or signals intelligence against any U.S. citizen and then hold on to this information for a period of 30 days. That was the legal reason why. That's actually true. But as, as I pointed out with the testimony of William Dugan, the Department of Defense representative, he actually tells the Senate Select Committee hearing chairman, Arlen Specter, um, that Ada was not technically a U.S. person. And that, yes, he may have had a, uh, a temporary student U.S. visa. It didn't technically make him a U.S. person. So that the information shouldn't have been destroyed on orders of the, uh, on orders of the Department of Defense or the U.S. Army. Um, so SOCOM lawyers uh, actually later on would then meet with um, Robert Worthington, who's the director of the Able Danger team from June of 2000 to January of 2001. And he tells them that from now on, you cannot hold any type of um, future meeting with the FBI regarding the subject nature. And by May of 2001, um, Schaefer actually is all but shut out by the US Army and SOCOM from extending any assistance from his, his own unit, Stratus Ivy, to help with the Able Danger unit. So now he's left alone. And he has no um, type of uh, help regarding able danger. In other words, he's still with the able danger unit, but he really doesn't have any backing, legal backing from the U.S. Army. Fast forward, after the 9-11 attacks, Schaefer would then be contacted in, in two weeks after the attacks from Eileen Presser, who was part of the able danger team. She meets him with coffee, and then she shows him one of the charts produced by the the LIWA team, the Land Information Warfare Activity Unit. The chart was produced in January of 2000. And on the chart was a photo of Muhammad Atta. And she shows this to Schaefer. Schaefer is like completely, his jaw hits the floor. He's absolutely sick to his stomach because Able Danger was absolutely on the right track, monitoring this group. And in 2003, while he's in Afghanistan, because he's still deployed in Afghanistan afterwards, um, Schaefer would hold a meeting with Philip Zalkow and the 9-11 Commission. And 
he was actually allowed by SOCOM lawyers to talk about in full the full covert operation of Able Danger in its entirety. Zelikow is like completely shocked. And he actually, after the meeting, he gives shape for his car. Just, just 30 and, seconds on who Philip Zelikow is, please. Oh, Philip Zelikow is the director of the, of the uh, 9-11 Commission. Um, and Zelikow actually gives shape for his car. And he actually says to him, quote, what you said here today is, is very important, end quote. And he thanks him for the information. Months later, Schaefer would actually return the court of, of Schaefer's, of Zelikow's office. In that, he's actually told that, oh yes, we, let me look into what Zelikow wants for me to do with you. And then when Schaefer calls back weeks later, um, the person actually tells Schaefer, we don't know who that person is, but the, the staffer actually tells Schaefer, I'm sorry, his name is Chris Kojum, by the way, Chris Kojum. So he tells Chris, uh, Chris Kojum, who's part of the 9-11 Commission staff, tells him that, um, well, we all, we know what we know about Able Danger, and that's all we want to know. End quote. Like, that's what he told him specifically. Schaefer returns to the United States in March 23rd of 2004. And immediately on his return to the United States, he finds out his top secret uh, SCI clearance is suspended. And the reason for this is simple, because he actually tells uh, the 9-11 Commission about the Able Danger operation. So for, for the preceding months and weeks and months afterwards, he's actually labeled um, persona, persona non grata, somebody who's not, who's not allowed inside the most sensitive areas of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. So the Pentagon actually goes as far as uh, labeling him as an outsider. He's still with, technically, with the Army, but he's not allowed to give any type of information, shared information with anybody, and so they restrict his manner of speech. So he goes and meets with uh, Pennsylvania Representative Kurt Weldon in an office in a meeting. And while there, he's with uh, Louis Libby and another person, and he tells Weldon about his situation. And Weldon actually says, all right, let me get my staffer to call the 9-11 Commission. And so he does. And the person actually calls Chris Cogen again of 9-11 Commission staff. And he tells him, what do you know about Able Danger and Anthony Schaefer? And so Chris Cogen tells him, quote, oh, yes, we've heard of Anthony Schaefer, but we decided not to use the Able Danger story in the 9-11 Commission report. So the staffer tells Chris Kojum, why not? And the staffer tells him, Chris Kojum tells him, in no uncertain terms, flat out, it didn't fit with the story that the commission wanted to tell, end quote. So what did ultimately appear in the commission report about cable danger? Nothing. <laughs> in fact, Schaefer, Schaefer's testimony, still to this day, it's actually his testimony, Mark Rossini's closed door testimony, and Thomas Drake of the NSA, uh, who gave closed door testimony meetings in which they gave real pertinent, sensitive information that was not used in the 9 11 Commission report. And Lord only knows what they said. And according to all three, they said that they had information which could have stopped the 9 or, or, or somehow interfered with the 9 11 mm. attacks in general because they had uh, human and signals intelligence about every single one of the operatives involved in the attacks. That's coming from Thomas Drake, no less, that they had information regarding all of the uh, people involved with the 9-11 attacks, all the 19 hijackers, so to speak, 19. Anyway, Able Dangerous information is not used in the 9-11 Commission, and he's barely ever mentioned, even in the, the, the monographs at the end, his name is mentioned there, but there's no... Um, in the book itself, there's no mention of Schaefer's Able Danger uh, Unit anywhere in the 9-11 Commission. So Weldon and Schaefer, uh, they, they couldn't believe what they were hearing. They couldn't believe it. So Weldon actually goes, and you could go on YouTube and you'll see him going before the U.S. House of Representatives, and he's like imploring both the Democrats and the Republicans, saying this is not a, bipo this is not a, a separate partisan issue. Uh, this is an issue involving... Anthony Schaefer and the United States itself. 
involved in, in, in that they were, they were slandering Schaefer for no good reason other than what he was telling the truth about the able danger uh, operation. And there was no good reason at all by the Department of Defense to keep him as persona non grata and suspend his uh, benefits um, and keep him from even uh, giving full testimony on his behalf in the, night living, uh, in the um, Senate Select Committee headed by our inspector. In fact, he had to, get, he had to uh, speak. Uh, Mark Zaid, who's a lawyer representing Schaefer, had to speak on his behalf because Schaefer was not allowed to testify. Um, okay, so, so sorry. That, yeah, now, now, now I would say that would probably be the end of Abe Danger. And incident, ironically enough, you don't hear anything anymore about this because in 2006, when Weldon was deploying to the media, to the House of Representatives about April Danger, it seemed that the story just died in 2007. Nothing started from it, even to the well, present time. Anthony Schaefer, um, just to sort of spoken about April Danger, let's just say what happened to him. He, he was redeployed to Afghanistan uh, in the years after 9 11, and that's what the majority of his book, Heart of Darkness, is about. Now, that was published um, 2011 time, I think, 2010, 2011. And um, uh, he mentions Abel Danger then. There's obviously an interesting story to the publication of the book, the Pentagon buying up copies and heavily redacting parts. So, yeah, it's the only book I've ever read where you get to a page and it's just black lines, the whole page where the information is redacted. Um, but that, his book was, A, a bestseller, and B, mentions Abel Danger. Right. So, and, and also, Adam, you were telling me before about the level of persecution that Anthony Schaefer endured um, right. in the years after. So maybe um, tell us something about his years post 9-11 um, with the persecution and the publication of his book and the shenanigans around that. Right. The, the book is named Operation Darkheart. Um, I have a copy. It's a very good book, actually. It talks in full depth about his deployment to Afghanistan as well as the Able Danger uh, operation itself. Um, when he's deployed to Afghanistan, he's actually uh, called back to the United States because they don't want him um, in Afghanistan anymore. They didn't want nothing to do with him. Instead of just um, letting him go and giving him uh, a dishonorable discharge, uh, because by doing that, he actually could talk to the media and give testimony about the Able Danger program. But what by suspending him, which is pretty smart, they're restricting him to not give any type of uh, testimony or, or any type of information to the media regarding his involvement with the operation because they didn't want anybody on the outside, the, uh, uh, the public actually, to know about the details of uh, Abel Danger. When after all that presided and his suspension was lifted and by the Department of Defense in 2007, I think, um, he actually writes the book, Operation Dark Heart, and um, he's, he co-authors the book. It, the first, I think, is, I want to say 11,000 copies, 8,000 to 11,000 copies. They're actually bought by the Pentagon and destroyed. Um, and so what are they trying to tell you? They're trying to say, we don't want the public to know about what, what Abel Danger was, what it involved, and what it, what it, what it could have prevented. And so what they did was, was they redacted the book, much of it anyway. Um, so even though you could buy the book today, it's, 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 it's heavily redacted. So there's so a lot of it. Was the idea there to get rid of the unredacted, were they unredacted copies that came out first? And then the Pentagon wanted to get rid of them. So, and so the, the copy that people would read would be a redacted one. So was it kind of successful in that it got rid of the unredacted copies? It, it did. And the, 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 the problem is, is that it really didn't show them in a really good light by doing so. Uh, what was, the, what was the, the information that's redacted? What, what, what didn't they want us to see? That's the question. And so, but we'll never know the answer because that information is not privy to the American public as of right now. Okay. Well, is there anything else you have to say on this topic? I don't know if I think we've covered uh, Able Danger well, pretty well. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, with Able Danger itself, um, most people are a little bit more familiar with Alex Station than Able Danger. And Able Danger actually um, 
had enough information, more than enough, uh, to warrant the F to share it with the FBI. And again, much like Alex Station, where the FBI wanted to use the information from the CIA to arrest Khalid al Minar and Nawaf al Hazmi out west, they were refrained from doing so. With Abel Danger, they had information, not just regarding uh, the Brooklyn Silver Rockman, but with Muhammad Atta out east, the Hamburg cell where they could have shared that information and started monitoring them right from 1999. And they were refrained from doing so, this time from the Department of Defense. So for people who want to say, well, it just goes to show you that they probably knew what was going to happen, I would be careful, but I wouldn't disagree with you in regards that they wanted these attacks to happen because of, of course, what came afterwards which was beneficial to not just the Pentagon, but to the intelligence apparatuses who got a blank check and removing the judicial um, restrictions, which were helpful to the American public. But now they're not because our information is now collected without a warrant. So get yourself familiarized with, with able danger as well as Alex Station. Um, so that's what I would say to the listener. Very good. And a good place to do that is Adam's article. Uh, which we will link to below. Thank you very much indeed, Adam, and we'll be back in a few days for more. Thank you very much, Richard.